This is Changemakers with Katie Gore, finding the right solutions for the affordable housing community. Welcome back to part two of my conversation with Michelle Norris, the Executive Vice President of External Affairs and Strategic Partnerships with National Church Residences. You know, you're responsible for the mission. Uh, You're responsible for impact and investment and obviously any kind of disaster recovery plans uh, Mm -hmm. that may come up. What does the day-to-day look like for you? Well, never the same. I'll start there. (laughs) Every day is a little bit different. Um, So yes, external affairs covers a lot of areas. So it is our public relations team. It is our crisis management team. It is our policy team, our philanthropy, and our volunteerism, as well as our chaplaincy support team. So there's a lot going on. And as I say, you know, we're kind of the umbrella that tries to support all the great work that our team is doing across the country. Um, So there is really never a typical day, but I guess to the bigger point about guiding our mission of greater focus and impact and investment, you know, the truth is that growth is part of our DNA. When I arrived here, we were about 100 communities compared to now where we're 350. We've also expanded what we do. We do senior independent market rate housing. We do agency work like hospice work. We have adult day centers. So we have diversified as well as grown. And so one of the challenges is that point of focused growth. So I'll give you an example. About five years ago, as part of our strategic plan, we decided it was important to divest of our small family portfolio in order to continue to go as deep as possible with all of our energy into the senior, our call to be all things senior. Well, that was hard because we had to do several things. Number one is find a truly good match. We didn't want to just sell our family portfolio to anybody. We wanted to find somebody who had a good mission match. Well, then from that point, we had to be really good communicators of that. We had to communicate to our team, to all of our partners. It was as complicated as it was to put them, bring them into the fold in the first place. So that's just kind of one example. But on the going forward example of focusing on our seniors, it really is this important impact that the senior population is growing so quickly, we have to decide what it is that we can do as quickly as possible to be as impactful as possible. And so we realize that that means we'll not be able to do it all. So we need to not only do, but we also need to be thought leaders, helping other people, sharing what we know, um, encouraging others to go deep in into what they're doing, to share with them what we've learned through our experience. And so that's one of the things I do is try to connect our work with partners across the country. So that's a, a little bit about what we do. You know, and I'm sure part of that thought leadership, you find yourself as an advocate for policies, whether they're local, state, or federal, but policies impacting the needs of seniors for affordable housing. And what would you say is, you know, the National Church Residents opportunity here as we you know, look at housing changing and, you know, as you're, you're talking about the future of senior housing, you know, what are your policy objectives or what is it that you guys are advocating for right now? Right. Well, great question. Thank you. Well, there's a few things on the federal level. Uh, first of all, I'm so encouraged by the energy right now that's at the federal level, um, both within the White House and at HUD. I'm really impressed with the new secretary, new secretary of Fudge. Of course, she's from Ohio, so what can you say? Great things come out of Ohio. So right now, we've got probably three big pillars that we're doing on the federal level. Number one is we need more HUD 202s. It is a terrific program. It's been in existence for about 60 years. It took a hiatus for about eight years. And it some ways blows my mind because it's eight years that we lost right as we're in this growth of seniors. So it was precious time lost. So we need to make up for that. And so the 202 program needs to be funded much more than it is right now. And um, so right now it was 150 million. We're hoping to get that up a lot higher for this next year. So that's one. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, service coordination. So for every HUD 202 
building that's out there, we think a service coordinator needs to be placed in that building and in every senior building, um, because not all of them are just two or twos. There are senior buildings that are section eight, there are senior buildings that are public housing. So service coordinators we know are valuable and uh, need to be, we need to have more of them. And then the third thing is what I think I mentioned earlier, HUD and HHS must do a better job of coordinating health care supports inside of housing. You call it home and community-based uh, services, HCBS, and that is funded out of HHS or CMS. It really does not coordinate well inside of senior affordable housing, and we could do so much more impact of allowing people to age in place if there was a coordinated effort. The reason that is so important is people don't realize that our seniors in senior affordable housing have no resources to go to assisted living. And so they really need to be have supports where they live, which is inside of affordable housing. So that is at a federal level. At um, the federal and state level, I'll add one more that's really important, and that is connectivity. We know that in um, how important connectivity is, it was so elevated during COVID. What people are mostly talking about right now is how that was so impactful and important for kids, which it totally was around education, right? But it is also critical that we allow connectivity because it is a way to access healthcare, not only during COVID, but post COVID. We have moved the needle on how you bring health assistance into your house if you can be connected. And we need to do a better job because most of the HUD assisted housing out there is not connected. And so that's a really big um, effort that I think we need to be working on. You know, it's an amazing how we used to think that was a discretionary point, you know, as far as connectivity mm -hmm. or for seniors or, you know, we, there weren't really a lot of options. And now we've really embraced the fact that this is a core essential utility in most regards because of what it provides and whether that is the telehealth option or it's the convenience or it's safety within their own home to be able to access you know, various Zoom meetings or informational or whatever it is. But so I think that, you know, that's definitely a positive um, evolution of, you know, a priority for, you know, your residents. You know, and, and one other thing that I've been impressed with is that you guys were the first of, in the nation, I believe, to close on a RAD deal for a Pratt conversion. Is that true? That is absolutely true. <laughs> so that's a, a major accolade. So tell fact. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Tell us about the details behind this deal and what the impact is here. Well, the impact is amazing. It, it took a long time for the organizations like Leading Age and SAFE and others to advocate and allow the HUD 202 prax to be eligible for the RAD conversion. And it was so important because just like public housing, the PRACs, which were, are now 25 years old, had no ability to be recapitalized. So the RAD for PRAC allows them to go back to the capital markets to convert their PRAC or their operating subsidy into Section 8 and leverage tax credits in order to do the necessary renovation to bring them back up to today's standards. 25-year-old buildings need facelifts. And 25-year-old buildings that were designed for seniors back then are different than where we are now. We know that aging in place features are more important than ever. And so it allows us to do all the necessary things for capital improvements, as well as the aging in place features for seniors. In this case, our first PRAC that we were able to do the conversion for happens to be in the state of Ohio. So we're still hoping that when we do our big grand opening that we would love to get the secretary to come out for it since um, it's in her state. But our goal of that not only was to renovate the building, but to really re-equip it for this aging and place features that we know are so important. And so we were able to work with a um, digital inclusion fund that was uh, provided by one of our local banks, Huntington, bank um, in order to wire and then provide devices for our residents in the building. 
So we're really excited that we're able to provide connectivity at the same time we were able to do this RAD conversion. So it was a big deal. We have several others in the pipeline. We are one of the nation's largest owners of PRACs. We have probably 90 or so PRACs in our portfolio. So it was a very big initiative for us that HUD was, is allowing us to come in and start the recapitalization process. I imagine your before and after pictures are going to look fantastic for these properties as well. Yes, we're very excited and um, couldn't be more honored than to be the first one to close. The HUD recap office were amazing with us, and we look forward to working with them on many more RAD conversions. You know, another thing that you guys are doing so well is that you guys are really advocates in the affordable housing space. And I think that's part of an unspoken job for all of us who are here. But, you know, we really view that we need to educate people on what affordable housing is and really what it's not. Uh, one of the mm -hmm. things that I've, I've covered on previous podcasts is that, you know, I've referenced debunking myths about affordable housing. Mm -hmm. And I've seen on your blog where you've even covered this. So what is your perspective or what would you say if you had to debunk a few affordable housing myths? Well, I think the common one people have is, oh, it's public housing from the 40s or 50s. And we really have got to get people past that. Um, housing authorities, as well as nonprofits and for-profits, are so sophisticated now in designing buildings, building buildings, engaging the community. Uh, and actually, you almost have to. Opinions are so strong that it is not only a, a personal goal of our organization, but also uh, I think it's almost a necessity to say that affordable housing must sit inside of the larger community in a way that's integrated. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really important for people to understand that is just how it, it works. And so people don't have to be afraid of affordable housing. I think the other thing, and this is a simple thing, but uh, one that I'm prone to do, is to speak the lingo of affordable housing. And I just did it when I talked about RAD for PRAC. You know, I talk about this, and if I mention this to a new board member, they'll look at me and say, what the heck are you talking about? So as affordable housing people, we really need to think about how do we educate the community without being so um, technical in our speak. We need to bring it to the public in a way that's a, a better education. I think we all need to spend more time doing that. It's not just educating the political people that can, you know, approve our funding. It's, you know, educating neighborhoods and, and neighbors and churches and because it's a very confusing world of affordable housing. And, you know, we we in the industry need to do a much better job of simply presenting affordable housing in a way that people can understand. You know, that's a good point because so many of us operate based upon the HUD lingo or the HUD program designation or the rules of mm -hmm. eligibility. And, and you know, we're talking about institutional program verbs um, and nouns, <laughs> but we're not mm -hmm. really saying, okay, we're delivering housing for working families, single mothers, seniors, you know, people... Mm -hmm you know, who are differently abled or, you know, veterans. And we, if we can personalize who is, who is it that we're serving as opposed to the institutional program verbiage, that is a technical nuance, but it's also saying, no, we're talking about the people here. We're talking about the needs, not, you know, the funding designation. We're not talking about the, you know, 20 year HAP agreement or <laughs> whatever it is that we're referencing. Right. So, that's a good point, and I think that's something that, you know, our industry should challenge ourselves, you know, to make a better, do a better job in here, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and, and kind of speaking about the industry, um, you're on several affordable housing boards, and, you know, Leading Edge, you mentioned, you know, Corporation for Supportive Housing, you mentioned, and you're also, you know, you've um, been a past president of the Ohio Housing Council, and then NAMA, which is the National Affordable Housing Management Association. You know, talk to us about the level of synergy that comes from within the industry 
as we try to solve the affordable housing crisis, you know, why are all these different organizations needed? And, you know, really, you know, what, what synergy is there amongst us? Well, first of all, synergy, uh, it's a great point. Synergy is so critical. Um, I have in my memory bank a time when I was on the Hill and I was talking to one of the committee uh, staffers in the Senate. I walked into her office and she looked at me and she was clearly having a bad day. She stood up and she said, walk with me. And she took me down to the um, cafeteria. And as we were going down, she lectured me on you people who can all come in with different ideas and different things you're looking for in affordable housing. You guys need to get your act together and ask for the same stuff. I learned then how important it was that we in the industry must be collectively on the same page. And so the different associations, I believe the value they bring is to help keep us all singing from the same songbook. And that is important for all the different levels that we need to sing to. We have to sing to the federal level, and that's both the regulatory and legislative, right? We've got to be able to all talk about what's important to change or tweak in HUD regs as much as we need to talk to Congress about funding and the programs. Um, we need to all talk at the state HFA level um, because that's really where the it drives the priority of of where the tax credits go and who gets funded. Um, and then we need to advocate at city and county levels because often the dollars that are uh, things like home monies and CDBG are allocated there. So it is up to us to be able to continue to message, so to speak, the same important priorities in order to make sure that the decision makers at all those levels are trying to prioritize the same things. And so I think that's why it's so important because left to our own devices, if we didn't work with these different associations, we'd only speak on behalf of our own organization. And then it becomes too complicated. And so I think that's why these organizations, these associations are so good. And I'd say the other thing they do is they bring, you know, no disrespect, but some healthy competition between all of us. There's no question if I hear one of my colleagues did a really cool, I would call it cool, innovative community, it makes me want to do it too. So I think it brings up a competition that makes us all better. You know, and it also allows us to keep that, you know, regional flair, community flair, at the same time, being able to, you know, best practice with somebody else, you know, just like you mentioned, you know, whether that's, you know, a competitive aspect of it, or whether that's just saying, you know, hey, they did it over there. And mm -hmm. why can't we have that same service offering or flexibility or design feature? Um, you know, I, I used to manage several senior sites myself back mm -hmm. in my previous life. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, one of the things that seniors um, do really, really well is, you know, they know what the other property service offerings and design offerings are and they advocate for themselves and they want that. That only brings that kind of information to a wider platform when the industries coordinate like that. So I've seen it work. It's possible. And mm -hmm. one final question here. Um, what is the actual need? You know, has, has there been a study that says this is the volume of need to meet the demand right now? How many units are we talking about nationwide that we need to provide for our seniors either today or trending over the next five years? Well, I can be very honest, I haven't seen a great study. I've seen a lot of projection of the growth of seniors overall. And here's just a great example. The Urban Institute recently shared that over half of all senior renters in, in the country are spending more than 30% of their income on their rent. And 25% wow. of those are spending 50% on their income. Oh my goodness. That right there, and probably what renters are 30%, 40% of senior um, households. So you can see, the it. you can just do the math. It's a very large number. And here's the way I see it, Katie. For every dollar that they're spending now on their rent more than they need to, that is accelerating their spend down. 
In other words, if they have a little bit of money saved up, you know, if they, let's say they have $50,000 in their piggy bank or $100,000 in their piggy bank when they retire, that's going to have to last them for 20 years, along with their, you know, Social Security and maybe a small pension. Every dollar that they spend in their 60s and 70s for too much rent, it's less money than they will have of that small piggy bank to keep them aging in place into their 80s and 90s. And often that means spending more on your rent means they end up with these terribly uncomfortable decisions of expensive medications or healthy food. A horrible, horrible decision that we're asking our seniors to make because we can't provide them enough affordable housing. I know that right now the supply versus demand is somewhere between, it depends on who you ask, one out of one, for every four people who need it, or sometimes I hear as high as one out of 10 who need it. It's a large gap. And so we need to do more to really bring that gap down and help our seniors stay healthy, longer in place in the home that they chose. Well, you bring a unique dynamic here. And I think that, um, you know, the conversations are, have been happening. Um, you have several people in the space who are listening and the evidence is there as to the impact when, you know, there's a lack of affordable housing. So, you know, all of these things and hopefully that, you know, we'll see the expansion of the programs now and the increased supply. So thank you for what you guys are doing and how strong you guys have been in this arena as we talk about affordable housing for seniors. Katie, thank you so much for the opportunity to share. It's been a pleasure talking with you, and I hope this was helpful. Thanks for listening to Changemakers with Katie Gore. To find out more about Katie, go to quadel.com. That's Q-U-A-D-E-L.com. This has been a production of Forbes Books Radio.